Hey guys and welcome back, or if you're new here, hi, welcome, my name's Georgia and on my platforms here on the internet I focus on unsolved true crime, trying to spread the word about unidentified people, missing people, murdered people and just trying to do some good. Today we're going to be talking about an unidentified person. Yes, this is a doe case, you all know by this point how passionately I feel about reuniting the unidentified with their identities. And in my kind of like constantly organised brain, this case comes under two very distinct categories I have here on my channel, here on my platforms on the internet. So there's a group of does who have their sort of public names that are simply an alias, so think Jennifer Fergate, Lorraine Stuhl, Peter Bergman, etc. And then you've got the people who were found dead in hotel rooms under mysterious circumstances. Again, Jennifer Fergate, Mary Anderson's case today is very, very, very similar to the Jennifer Fergate case. You've got Greg Flenikin in room 348, Artemis Ogletree in room 1046. For my YouTube viewers, I'll leave some links down below for those videos in case anyone is interested. And for my podcast listeners, I do want to start work on sort of slowly uploading my back catalogue onto Mysteries and Histories which is the name of my podcast for anyone who's interested. You can find Mysteries and Histories on any podcasting platform. It's everywhere. People are always shocked that I have a podcast, so I really need to start like plugging it more on my YouTube channel. It is called Mysteries and Histories. It's on all streaming platforms. It is basically the audio of these videos just made into podcast form so people can listen on the go. But anyway, I went a bit off topic there. The case of Mary Anderson that we're going to be talking about today very much sits at the intersection of both of those. Mary Anderson is not her real name and she was found dead under mysterious circumstances in a hotel room. Our story today starts on October 9th, 1996 in Seattle, Washington in the USA. A woman called to book a room at Hotel Vintage Park, a luxury boutique hotel in Seattle. Today, in 2023, the hotel is still considered to be a luxury boutique, although now it's a wine-themed boutique hotel named Kimpton Hotel Village, located at 1100 Fifth Avenue in downtown Seattle. This mysterious woman arrived an hour and a half after a call. She arrived in a cab that dropped her around the corner, and she carried two bags with her into the lobby, but other than that, she was completely alone. Upon checking in, she signed the register Mary A. Anderson, and according to an article in the Seattle Post Intelligencer from October 6, 2005 by Carol Smith, no one at the check-in desk remembered any sort of hesitancy in her writing this name, but investigators would later note that there were signs of hesitation in the writing. Mary Anderson was a fake name, an alias, and often when people are signing documents under fake names, they hesitate as if sort of trying to remember what they should be writing, remembering how to spell it correctly, ensuring that they're not giving away that it's fake, and in doing that, you see that in the writing. As if entirely thought through, there were no tags on her luggage, there was nothing that would give away her true identity and she didn't need to give in an ID. At the time of check-in, no one had any reason to think that Mary Anderson was a fake name. And the desk clerk checking her in couldn't remember anything particularly strange or unusual about her. She had no noticeable accent and nothing that would suggest that she was out of place. She paid in cash for two nights, which was about $350. When checking in, she left her address as 132 East 3rd Street in New York with a zip code 11103, an address that doesn't exist. I mean, 132 East 3rd Street does exist in both Brooklyn and Manhattan, but not in conjunction with the zip code that was left, that was for Astoria. Does this maybe suggest that she had some familiarity with New York City? The zip code beginning 111 is indeed a New York zip code, like I said, for Astoria, just not for that exact address. Or was she just using a generic address, 132 East 3rd Street, and happened to know the zip code for NYC 111, so she just went with that? As well as the fake address, she also left a fake phone number which didn't exist. And then Mary Anderson went up to her room. She wasn't heard a thing from for the next two days after putting a do not disturb sign on the door. As per her wishes, she was not disturbed. Now Mary was supposed to check out two days later on October 11th, 1996, but when she failed to materialize, staff at the hotel were forced to enter the room to check that everything was okay. And what they found was not okay. Mary Anderson was dead on the bed, propped up against the pillows with a Bible open across her chest. The bellman who had gained entry noted that she looked like she was just asleep at first, but when she didn't respond to people literally breaking into her room, he checked for a pulse and failed to find it. It was soon very clear that she'd taken her own life. 
The Bible on her chest was open to the 23rd Psalm, The Lord is my shepherd. It's one of the Psalms most often heard at funerals. It's the one that reads, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. It was quite fitting for what had happened. After finding her passed away, the hotel staff quickly called the police, who then called the medical examiner's office and the investigation began. I can imagine going into this, they had no idea that this was going to be an enduring mystery that even almost 27 years later, they still wouldn't know the answer to. They probably assumed that Mary Anderson was just Mary Anderson, but it soon became very clear that she was impossible to trace. Mary Anderson didn't exist. On the bedside table, there was a prescription bottle, but the label, which presumably once held her real name, had been removed. There was also a note written on hotel stationery, and the note read, To whom it may concern, I have decided to end my life and no one is responsible for my death, Mary Anderson. P.S. I have no relatives, you can use my body as you choose. That was it, there was nothing heartfelt or anything about her experience in life, about why she'd chosen to end her own life in this way. It was just very sort of logistical, very practical. A woman putting her affairs in order at the end of her life, presumably thinking she's curbing a big investigation into a potential murder. I bet she didn't think people would still be searching for her identity in 2023. She signed the note Mary Anderson, her fake name, which is very interesting. She could have just omitted a name altogether. But according to Dr. Kathy Taylor for the Washed Away podcast, and she's a forensic anthropologist for Washington State who worked very closely on this case, the signature at the end of this letter didn't look the same as the one when she'd signed in to the hotel. The flow of the writing was very off, as if somebody was sort of experimenting how to write this new name, as if she hadn't written it very many times. It wasn't natural. This, combined with the fake number and the fake address, and how they've never managed to find any trace of this woman at all, like she just doesn't exist, and the fact that no one called Mary Anderson has ever been reported as missing, led investigators to believe that this was a fake name. Also, if you're choosing an alias, the names Mary and Anderson are fairly common, it's like a man choosing the name John Smith. Quickly into the search for Mary Anderson's next of kin, they realised that this just wasn't her name. The whole situation with the Bible is very interesting to me actually because most sort of arms of Christianity would call suicide a sin. It's a one-way ticket to hell. Mary was clearly religious enough to want to die with the Bible open on her chest, but not religious enough for that to keep her alive. Which, if I'm being honest, is probably most casually religious people, but it is interesting nonetheless. One of the very first things investigators actually did was call every single Mary Anderson in the phone book, just checking if each one was alive and well. Something which Dr. Taylor said to the Washed Away podcast was a very awkward conversation to have with each person, because they'd literally just answer the phone and then as soon as they answered, you'd know they were alive. After that point, they just put it out to the media and they had a lot of people calling saying they knew a Mary Anderson, but none of it was helpful. Like I said, Mary Anderson, very common name, there are a lot of them out there. The investigators had to rule out that this wasn't a known Mary Anderson before they could sort of 100% commit to the avenue of that not being her real name. An investigation at the scene in the hotel room turned up very few clues. There were absolutely no identifying documents and she'd clearly gone to great lengths to conceal her identity. This was obviously either a very smart woman or somebody who had done her research even removing her dental plates to ensure they couldn't be traced back to her via maybe a security number or dental records. Investigators ran her fingerprints through the FBI's fingerprint identification system and that came back with nothing. They checked both American and Canadian missing persons reports with Seattle being pretty close to the Canadian border and again, they found nothing, nobody even similar to Mary being reported as missing. They checked with Interpol, the International Criminal Police Organization, and the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. They contacted the media, getting her details cast out as wide as they could. Nobody came forward. Eventually, Mary Anderson was categorized as unidentified, a Jane Doe. The King County Medical Examiner's Office were the ones in charge of Mary's autopsy, finding that her cause of death was a cocktail of cyanide and metamucil. Now we all know what cyanide is, it's a rapidly acting poison that basically stops the body being able to use oxygen effectively. But when I googled what Metamucil was, I was very surprised to see it was simply a fibre supplement. It's not another dangerous poison. 
According to drugs.com, metamucil is a bulk forming fibre laxative that can be used to treat occasional constipation or bowel irregularity, or it can be used to help lower cholesterol. All of my research into this case didn't provide any sort of solid answer as to why the metamucil and why it was mixed with cyanide. It doesn't seem like it has any effect on the poison or makes it sort of more potent. I think it was probably just a supplement that Mary used in life and she was used to the taste of it, probably liked the taste of it. So I figured she'd mix it with the cyanide, which can taste incredibly bitter. It made it taste nice and that was it. With no other marks on the body, no signs that she died from anything other than cyanide poisoning, that's what her cause of death was noted as, and it was indeed death by suicide. When somebody chooses to ingest cyanide, there's no doubt over what they were trying to do, like Mary ended her own life. Having been dead for not even 48 hours at the absolute maximum when she was found, Mary's body was actually very visually unaffected. She wasn't decomposed, she didn't have any injuries obscuring her features, she was entirely recognisable. Now there are photos available online of Mary as she was found on the bed and I always do kind of flip between whether I should show death photos in the case of does or not on my channel. On one hand they're kind of the best you're going to get when it comes to identifying someone, an actual photo is going to be 10 times better than just a reconstruction. But then on the other hand people's faces do change after death, these very small slight changes that can make them completely unrecognisable, especially when loved ones don't want to be seeing the face of someone they know. Also, I get that not all people want to see photos of people in death, no matter if it is for the greatest good. Greatest good? Greater good. So what I'll do is I'll leave a link down below to the photos for my YouTube viewers and people can peruse if they wish. If you want to see what Mary really looked like instead of just reconstructions, go click on there. According to the Doe Network, Mary Anderson is estimated to have been between 30 and 50 years old, which is quite an age range. She was a white female, 5'8", 240 pounds, with brown to auburn hair with brown eyes. She was very well put together, clearly taking a lot of time on her appearance before her death. Her hair was neatly combed and her nails were painted a cream white colour. She was also wearing very heavy makeup, which made her appear much older than she was. If you asked me from looking at her post-mortem photos, I would have said that she was way towards the higher end of the 30 to 50 spectrum, actually maybe even older than 50. But Dr. Taylor has said that they were shocked when they started removing the makeup because she looked so much younger without it. In terms of any sort of distinguishing marks or features, it has been noted that Mary had a copper IUD and she also had breast surgery at some point in her life, with scars beneath both of her breasts and around the nipple. And it seems like this was a breast reduction surgery at some point, further sort of nailing in the point that she likely cared enough about her appearance to go through surgery. Or she suffered with very bad back pain, either or. It didn't appear that Mary had ever given birth, and other than the cyanide poisoning, she appeared to be in very good health. There was no sort of terminal condition, no illness that would have caused her to want to end her life prematurely. I mean, they even examined her hands very carefully to see if they pointed at any particular career or hobby. Sometimes if the deceased person has a certain pattern of calluses or they have like particularly rough or soft hands, you can maybe take a guess at the field they worked in. Like somebody working with their hands all day is gonna have the telltale signs of maybe being a builder or something like that. A guitarist or a drummer is gonna have certain calluses. Mary had nothing, just very normal hands. She was wearing black leggings and a black top at the time of her death, although she did have a number of additional personal items sort of dotted around the hotel room. Again, the Doe Network notes that she had velour outfits, shoes, slippers, black leather gloves, a leather purse, Estee Lauder cosmetics, toothpaste, perfume, she had the metamucil that she mixed with the cyanide, crystal light drink mix, pantyhose, a kitchen bowl, and bizarrely, a full-size iron all packed in a number of luggage bags that she'd brought with her. None of that hinted even slightly at an identity. None of the clothes had a name label, there was nothing identifying in her purse, and the rest were just random items. For a bit more detail, according to the Seattle Post Intelligencer article, the velour outfits were half a dozen separates and shades of emerald green, fuchsia, navy and black, all hanging very neatly in the closet in the hotel room. She had a cobalt blue Himalaya outfitter's jacket and the black leather gloves were from Nordstrom. Her purse had $36.78 in cash, but no ID. She was a clothing size 10 US, so it's equivalent to size 14 in the UK. She had no key, no ID, no credit cards, nothing. 
She had two pairs of glasses and also had a number of items from sort of like mid-range branded names. Brands like The Villager, Alfred Dunner, both of which were available at Bon Marche or JCPenney. She wore very bright lipstick, so Estee Lauder's Starlit Pink or Rich and Rosy. And she also wore Estee Lauder Private Collection perfume. This doesn't scream of somebody with a huge wealth, but she certainly wasn't living in poverty to be able to afford such nice items. She was just very sort of mid-range. At one point, at a point of desperation, investigators started going through all the items and finding their serial numbers, seeing if they could trace them back to where they were purchased. Maybe at the very least, they'd be able to find out where Mary was originally from. Maybe if she'd paid by check or credit card, they might actually be able to find her name. They tried to track the cosmetics, the iron, even the copper IUD, but all led to dead ends. The makeup, it turns out, was from department stores available in multiple different states, and the lot the Metamucil came from was originally shipped to Phoenix, but at that point could have gone to anywhere in the country. The serial number on the IUD had worn away, so that was another dead end. Now, as it stands today, Mary's fingerprints are in the system, but in 27 years, they've never had a hit. Her dental chart is also in the system and again, never had a hit. And as with many cases currently, her DNA is where things are looking interesting. Now her DNA has been in CODIS for many, many years now and has also never had a hit. But as I've mentioned in many episodes before this, CODIS requires an exact match. So somebody who knew Mary in life has to upload her specific DNA profile for the database to strike a match. It's not like forensic genetic genealogy where it will link you to anyone who's a blood relative. Also, if Mary is indeed Canadian, as they might suspect, CODIS is US only and has no links to Canada. But why do they suspect she's Canadian, apart from the fact that Seattle is very close to the Canadian border? Well, it turns out they found a pressed maple leaf on one page of a copy of Seattle Weekly found on the desk. Was this Mary leaving a very subtle clue and a marge to her home country before her death? Was this a challenge to the investigators? The investigators actually eventually redoubled their efforts to search in Canada, but obviously this never led to any answers. At the time, a man called Jerry Webster was the chief investigator at the Kings County Medical Examiner's Office, and he became the man in charge of Mary's affairs after her death, at least until the next of kin could be found. Jerry has ordered for her personal items to never be released from the medical examiner's office until she is finally identified. And it had to be him who eventually ordered for her body to be embalmed and buried, knowing there was nothing more they could ascertain from her body. Mary's buried on the edge of Ballard in the Crown Hill Cemetery. She had no ceremony, no service, not even a marker on her grave. But Jerry Webster has always remained committed to finding out who Mary Anderson is. What's always stood out to people, to investigators, about Mary Anderson is the deliberateness of her death. I know some people will still theorise that this was murder, that maybe somebody snuck into Mary's room in the dead of night and forced her to ingest cyanide, but it really doesn't seem like that is the case, or at least investigators have never investigated this as a murder. There's no signs pointing in that direction. It seems very clear that Mary chose this exit and she was very methodical about it. And this is likely a clue about her personality in life as well as death. She was methodical, she liked to plan, she liked to know what was coming next. She was very careful. The hotel room was clean and tidy, everything was organised, the clothes were hung up. She ensured there was nothing identifying in that room, but potentially left small clues pointing in certain directions, like the maple leaf. At some point in that room, she mixed herself up a concoction of cyanide and metamucil and drank it, before lying back on the pillows. She maybe read her Bible, and as she faded away, placed it on her chest, slowly letting life fade away. The use of cyanide was very interesting to investigators in this case, as it likely meant that she had some education. She knew exactly how much to take to end her life. It also meant that she had the means to get a hold of it, something which isn't really open to everyone. I mean, you can't just walk into a shop nowadays or in 1996 and just buy cyanide off the shelves. It is a controlled substance. So did she work in an industry where she was able to get a hold of it more easily? Investigators played with the idea that she may have worked for a mining company or a chemistry lab, either in the medical field or at a university. But once again, a search provided nothing of any use. 
And as people always do suspect in cases like this, when people seem particularly skilled at hiding their identities, they did play with the idea that Mary could have been a spy working for an intelligence operation. Ali Marquis, the primary investigator on this case, did say to the press that this was entirely possible, that her appearance was vaguely Eastern European looking, although she did clearly have very good command of the English language. Remember, the desk clerk said she had no accent at all, which again suggests that she was probably from the Washington area. If I'm being honest, I do always suspect that investigators play on the spy angle in cases like this, just because that's the kind of stuff that people tend to pay attention to. That's what the media will grab onto and help you get your story out there. I mean, in how many dose situations have we spoken about the spy theory in the past for it to never ever be the case? Although I suppose it only ever takes one. I think the late 90s is probably one of the last times someone would be able to make themselves truly anonymous, to be able to end their lives in such a way as Mary did. With the dawn of the noughties and the internet, social media, digital footprints, it would be a lot more difficult now to do what Mary did. Despite real life and internet sleuths' best efforts, no one has ever found a single clue as to who Mary is. Investigators said at the time that they doubted Mary was being truthful when she wrote in her note that she had no family, but the reality is, almost 27 years on, and no one has ever come forward claiming her, or at least no one's ever come forward reporting someone of her description as missing. The truth is, family dynamics can be very messy and very complicated. Mary may well have had a family out there who maybe she didn't speak to. Or maybe she didn't have a family, maybe she was an only child who lost her parents and it really was just her out there all alone. It makes me sad to think about how somebody could feel so alone in this world. But then again, Mary did have an IUD in, a birth control device. This suggests that at some point, Mary was either in a relationship or she was sexually active. There are people out there who crossed paths with her. Copper IUDs can stay in for sort of five to 10 years. So this likely would have been in the decade before her death. I wonder if maybe Mary found herself widowed with no children and maybe fell into a depression because depression is likely the reason that she ended her own life. It's the silent killer. It makes people feel worthless, like life isn't worth living. And there's a stigma as well, particularly for somebody of Mary's age living in the 90s, in a world before people decided to open up about their mental health. Perhaps Mary didn't feel like she could talk to anyone and decided this was the best way out. She'd clearly thought about what she was going to do a lot, and you can only hope that she felt some peace before she took that cyanide. She was happy with her decision. According to the National Institute of Health, as of 2020, 21 million adults in the US have suffered with at least one major depressive episode, which is 8.4 of all US adults, the prevalence of which is higher amongst adult females at 10.5% compared to males at 6.2%. Now I'm citing major depression here because for Mary to take her own life, you have to assume that that's what she was suffering from, major depression. It's also suspected that perhaps Mary felt invisible in life. Now this is purely speculation, but speculation that I'm echoing from the investigators on this case, she was clearly a woman who took great pride in her appearance. Perhaps she felt like as she aged, she was feeling invisible, alone, overlooked by everyone else. This is a phenomenon echoed by middle-aged women time and time again. A statistic that I came across whilst researching for this episode is that whilst, at least back in the early noughties, men did have triple the rate of suicide, women attempted it three times more often but were less successful. Now that is according to the Seattle Post Intelligencer article I mentioned earlier. I couldn't find the original source for that number, so maybe take it with a pinch of salt. I couldn't sort of find updated statistics on suicide attempts, only sort of the successes. Women are more vulnerable to depression for many, many reasons, but hormones are a huge one, especially in women around Mary's age who are going through the menopause or perimenopause. Their hormones thrown entirely out of whack. You've got to at least consider that an option here, that Mary was maybe going through the menopause and she was just really depressed as a result of that. I've also got to cover how there's been a lot of discourse online about this case and similar ones when it comes to identifying people who clearly did not wish to be identified. And it is a topic we've discussed at length before, specifically in my video about the Annandale Jane Doe or the Christmas tree Jane Doe. She ended her life in a very similar way to Mary, leaving a note saying she did not wish to be identified. 
Annandale Jane Doe was identified just last year though as Joyce Meyer through genetic genealogy. Is this right? Should we be trying to identify people who don't wish to be identified when it's clearly their final wish? Now this is a multifaceted topic to discuss, it's very much not just black and white. My personal angle is this, and people are welcome to disagree, just disagree nicely, but life is for the living. Someone can choose to end their life if they wish to do so, but the final wishes of the dead don't always have to be followed, especially when so much time has passed, such as in a case like this one. It eventually becomes a case of identifying her for the people that were left behind. Mary said she had no family, but how do we know to believe her without an identity? Maybe she does have a family, maybe they've been searching for her down all the wrong roads for the past 27 years. Maybe she was mentally ill, deep in the throes of depression, and she wasn't thinking clearly, the dark cloud having taken over. Perhaps if Mary had managed to get out the other side of the dark cloud, her wishes would have been entirely different. Maybe she would have made a different choice. At the end of the day, at this point in time, 27 years on, identifying Mary isn't going to make a difference to her, she's long buried, but it might make the world of difference to the investigators who've been searching for her for so many years, to the people who've been wondering where she is for the longest time. Because at the end of the day, even when we don't realise it, we're all making impacts on other people every single day. Maybe Mary didn't have any family, but what if she had a friend who noticed that she was gone one day? A waitress who always served her at the local cafe who had her usual meal ready to go, but she just didn't turn up one day. A cashier she'd always chat to at the grocery store who's suddenly wondering where she is. A past lover who wanted to reconnect and couldn't find her. There are always people who will notice that you're gone and will miss you in their own way. For all we know, maybe one of these people went to the police to try to report her as missing, but as they're not family, the report wasn't taken seriously. It's human nature to be curious, to want the answers, and it seems like we may actually get them here because Othram is on the case as of May 2021. Her case was put up for crowdfunding on dnasolves.com to use advanced DNA testing and forensic genealogy to establish an identification. As I said, this was May 2021 and it doesn't look like there's been a single update since then, it is now May 2023, so we've just got to sit and wait. Othram are amazing though, they've helped crack so many unsolved cases and they've identified so many people, so I have no doubt they will get there too in Mary's case, but it is a very long process. And if Mary was being honest and that she had no family, it's probably quite complicated too. There have been multiple reconstructions of Mary over the years, all of which look incredibly different from the next, some featuring her with makeup, some without. For my YouTube viewers, you will have seen them on screen throughout this episode, but for my podcast listeners, just type Mary Anderson Doe into Google and you can take a look at her face. I mean, you never know if you recognise her, it's worth a look. Thank you so much for tuning in today, thank you for choosing to spend this time with me and with Mary Anderson who hopefully one day soon will have her real name back. It may well be a case of investigators finding her real name, contacting her living relatives and they decide never to share any more information. We might never know what that name is but the people who are closest to her will just have that ounce of closure and that is what's important here. So I think that's always important to remember in Doe cases and unsolved cases in general. We as the active viewers here, the active listeners, aren't always entitled to the information. It's the people who love them who need that closure. And I'm going to end on that note. Bye guys.